Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. This week I chose an episode from Columbia Workshop called Remodeled Brownstone. Like last week's suspense episode, Fugue in C Minor, Remodeled Brownstone was written by Lucille Fletcher, one of radio's most celebrated writers. During the 1930s, Fletcher worked for CBS as a music librarian, publicity writer, and most significantly, a typist. Between 1934 and 1939, Fletcher typed and read hundreds of radio plays, slowly but surely mastering the form. Her first original radio play, The Hitchhiker, made its debut in 1941 on The Orson Welles Show. CBS was so pleased with the play, they invited Welles to perform it again for suspense. Although Fletcher would go on to write many scripts for suspense, including her most famous script, Sorry Wrong Number, she was also a regular contributor to another CBS series, Columbia Workshop. CBS created the Columbia Workshop in 1936 under the direction of Irving Reese. The network envisioned the series as an incubator for radio talent, a place where artists could experiment with new ideas and techniques without the creative and budgetary restrictions of a sponsor. Over the course of its initial six-year run, the series featured a who's who of radio talent, including Orson Welles, Archibald McLeish, Norman Corwin, William N. Robeson, Arch Obler, and Bernard Herrmann. From 1940 to 1942, Fletcher wrote five scripts for the Columbia Workshop, including one we've already discussed, an adaptation of the gothic vampire novel Carmilla. In keeping with the Columbia Workshop's mandate to experiment, Fletcher's plays varied greatly in style and tone, from Alf, the All-American Fly, a comedic fantasy about talking insects, to the tale you're about to hear, a contemporary twist on the classic Victorian ghost story. Now, let's listen to Remodeled Brownstone from Columbia Workshop, originally aired October 19th, 1942. It's late at night and a chill has set in. You're alone and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker, listen to the music, and listen to the voices. The Columbia Workshop. Tonight, the Columbia Workshop presents a new radio play by Lucille Fletcher called Remodel Brownstone. Sit down, gentlemen. You're experts in matters of the mind, and I hope you'll understand when I tell you that this house has nothing to do with my wife's terrible condition. This is a brownstone house, gentlemen. And I know that there are people, queer people, who say that New York brownstone houses are haunted. I have one friend who insists he wouldn't live in a brownstone house for a million dollars. My wife Clara used to say that, too. But I convinced her differently. This is a brownstone, I admit. But it's been thoroughly remodeled from top to bottom. It has new floors, new plumbing, a new heating system, an entirely different arrangement of rooms. All it retained of the old Victorian house is the distinction, the charm. And don't you find brownstones charming, gentlemen? I do. I've loved them as a boy, and I shall love them till the day I die. To wander through these quiet New York streets, see them standing there, so gracious, so dignified, to see the sunset turning their facades to a mellow, reddish color, to see the light of some occasional sidewalk maple flickering across their high stoops and old railings, that is what I consider a real treat. Years ago, as a young man, I made up my mind that if I ever became rich... I would own one. And I may say, in all modesty, gentlemen, that that dream has actually come true. (sighs) Only one thing 
has spoiled the pleasure of owning it. And that is the unreasonable malady, the strange hysterical delusion of my wife. It's darkened these lovely rooms for me until I can no longer enjoy them. It's filled these walls with ghosts. Until now, I dread opening the front door. I dread coming home. Perhaps I should begin from the beginning. That'll be 75 cents, mister. 75? Uh, yep. Please take 85 out of the dollar. Thank you. Well, one twenty-six. Looks as though this was it. Oh, I, I don't think so, Alice. 126, isn't that the address the agent gave you? Yes, but it's so old looking. It's positively ancient, Alex. Look at that uh, crumbling stoop and the windows and that little gate leading down into the basement. I'm sure nobody's lived in it for years. Well, we'll see. Here's the Holmes Agency man to open her up. Alex, it really isn't what I had in mind at all. Well, well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. You're from the Holmes Agency. That's right. Did I keep you waiting? No, no, we just got here. Can we go in now? We certainly can. It'll be quite a place. But the whole thing's empty now. Empty as a kettle. Uh, here we are. Oh, come on in, dear. It's so dark and musty. I don't suppose there are any rats. Rats? What would rats want with an empty house? been empty a long, long time, hasn't it? Uh, seven or eight years, lady. Seven or eight years? Yes, they tell me it's a good buy for anybody who wants to spend a little money on it and fix it up. That's just what we do want to do. Fix it up, you know. Completely. Remodel it, new floors, new plumbing, new fixtures, paint. You see, dear? Here's the kitchen. Looking out into the garden. Oh, it's horrible. Well, certainly, darling. All these old Victorian kitchens are mighty dismal places. Wait till we get those bars down from the windows, the walls tiled, and a nice new electric stove. Mm, uh, I can almost smell those meals, those big, heavy Victorian dinners. Come on. Come upstairs and see the drawing room. They tell me the marble fireplaces in this house are magnificent. We went all over it that day. It was barn of a place then. The stairs were dusty. The drawing room was as big as a barracks with a tarnished pier glass at one end. The back parlor was gloomy with faded brown linen cluster and stained glass windows. On the third floor, the floors of the big gaunt bedrooms creaked and groaned under our feet. And the old bathrooms were dingy without motored plumbing. But I could see the possibilities. I could see them growing even as we climbed the last flight of stairs to the very top story of the house. An ugly, low-ceiling place divided into many little rooms. Stairs get you down a bit, don't they? Yes. And you're not used to climbing. <laughs> Otherwise, it's quite a buy for the money, don't you think so, dear? Alex, what were all these rooms used for? Uh, these little rooms? Why? Uh, this was the nursery up here, ma'am. You know, uh, where they kept the children. <laughs> the children? You mean they made the children stay up here all by themselves so far away from the rest of the house? Yes, yes. Funny people in the old days. Now, my kids play all over the flat. Poor little things. If they cried, nobody could hear them. They were up here all alone. Oh, come, dear. Don't get sentimental about it. The nurses were up here with him, you know. Rich mothers never looked after their own children. Anyway, what are you worrying about children's rooms for? That's one problem that won't bother us. No. Floor like this would make an ideal game room. Or a billiard room. One thing I've always wanted to have is a billiard room. We could tear down all these walls and make one grand big room of the whole thing. We could have a ping-pong table, too, and a bar. Oh, no, Alex, not a bar. Why not? What's the matter with a bar all of a sudden? The, the children's rooms, Alex. You couldn't make the little children's rooms into a bar. Nonsense. The children who lived here are dead and gone long ago. You wait and see how it looks when it's done. Modernist. Lots of chrome and indirect lighting and broad loom on the floors. And maybe over there in that part, a big cake heart. Oh, you'll love it yourself when it's done. Oh, Alex, you're really planning things, aren't you? You do like this dreadful house. It's not dreadful, my dear. It looks pretty dreary now, of course, on the surface. But wait till Hodgkin gets busy. You'll never know it was the same place. Even if we're altogether different, I'd, I'd feel it was always like this. I'd be thinking of, of those sad little rooms and the lonely dead children. Oh, Alex, please listen to me. Dust this once. You can't go tampering with a place like this. Why, why, it's been like this for 50 years. It's like, like desecrating a person. Oh, oh, no. Clara, take it easy. We won't do anything to the house you don't approve of. You can tell the architect anything you want. 
In the end, she didn't want to change anything. She didn't make any suggestions. She just let me go ahead and do anything with the house I wanted. That's why I say I don't see how anybody could blame her condition on the house itself. Because, you see, it isn't an old house anymore. Look at this room. This room was once the drawing room and dining room and back parlor. Would you ever believe it? And in a few moments, I'll show you the billiard room on the fourth floor. The beautiful modern room I dreamed about that day. Do you feel queer here? Nobody who's ever come here has ever felt anything but cheerful and modern and 20th century. Nobody has ever felt or heard anything. Except her. Almost 11. Well, it certainly has been a busy day. But worth it, worth every bit of it. To be settled at last. Yes. You tired, dear? No. You ought to be. I'm packing all that china and those linens. I don't see why you didn't let Madeline do it for you. Oh, I guess I am tired. Somehow I can't seem to drop off. Want a sleeping tablet? No. Somehow I just... Just seem to keep hearing things. What things? Oh, just things. There it goes again. Did you hear it just now? No, what is it? I've been hearing it for the past half hour. And it's quite plain. Oh, Clara, for heaven's sake, don't be so nervous. Come back. It will come back in a couple of seconds. Across the floor. What is it? There. There it is. Did you hear it then? Nothing. You didn't hear it. Across the floor upstairs. The kind of quick scurrying patter. No. But if anything, it's probably a mouse. No, Alex. It was much too loud for a mouse. All right. Maybe it's a rat then. After all, we've just moved in and you can't expect the place to be perfect. I'll call up the exterminators in the morning. Alex, Alex, wake up. Hmm? Uh, yes, darling, what is it? What's that? Alex, I... I just heard it again. Well, heard what? The, the scurrying sound upstairs on the fourth floor. Oh, the devil am I going to hear this thing right now. I told you I'd get the exterminators. The exterminators were here this morning. And Alex, it's not a rat, I'm sure of it. I've been listening to it here in the dark. And I've heard it several times and doesn't sound like a rat at all. Oh, what else could it be? There's nobody up there. I don't know, but Alex, it's, it's too loud for a rat. It's too distinct. It's more like steps. Footsteps? Like tiny little footsteps hurrying and hurrying very fast across the floor. Across the nursery floor, Alex. Oh, go on. It's like the footsteps of a child, a restless little child. Oh, Alex, I can't be fooled. Do you remember that apartment we used to have on Park Avenue just underneath the family that had the little child? Do you remember how we used to hear his footsteps running across the floor, across our ceiling all day long until they, they put him to bed? Well, that's the same sound up there now. Now, darling, how could a little child be running around up there when it's dark, when there's nothing up there but a nice, big, modernistic billiard room? You're tired and nervous. You just lie there listening till the creak of a floorboard sounds as loud as a pistol shot. But I hear it. I hear it over and over again, as plain as day. Well, I suppose I'll have to go up there sooner or later and take a look around. Oh, no, no, don't go. Oh, no, don't worry. I'm not afraid. There's nothing in this world that can bother me. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. I, I meant just to, to leave him alone. Him? Oh, I know it probably sounds silly, but... Oh, Alex, he's been disturbed enough. He's... Oh, just leave him alone. Clara. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, what are you talking about? Oh, I don't know. I really don't know. But I have a feeling. Oh, Alex, let's leave this house. Let's get away from leave here. Leave this house when we've only just moved in? Oh, yes. <laughs> I have it. I know where it's coming from and what's causing it. It's from next door. 
The house next door. You know how closely these brownstone houses are connected. You know how sound travels at night. Now, couldn't it be possible that the people next door have a little child? Alex, there isn't anybody living next door. The house is empty. It has a for sale sign on the window. Oh, well, that's on the Park Avenue side. The house toward Lexington Avenue has curtains up and awnings. Don't you remember? I, I can't seem to remember just now. Well, you look out the window in the morning, or you might even telephone. Now, if you don't, I'm very tired. Good night. Good night, dear. Hello? Oh, hello. Uh, this is Mrs. Alexander Archer, the lady who lives next door. Yes, Mrs. Archer. We moved in a month or so ago. A-R-C-H-E-R. A as in apple, R as in... I beg your pardon, but could you tell me whether you have a little child? I said, do you by any chance have a little child? Is there a child living in... Child, C as in coffin, H as in... <laughs> I began to catch her listening after that. Listening at night, listening at all times of the day. I would come home from the office at dusk to find her sitting in the living room with her knitting in her lap. All the lamps would be lit. The fine old English furniture would look so beautiful and luxurious in the light. But she would be sitting there like someone in a trance. She'd stop in the middle of a meal and start to run out into the hall. Clara, Clara, sit down. Where are you going? What will the servants think? The servants hear it too, Alex, I know. Don't be ridiculous. Madeline's leaving tomorrow. She's given notice. She says it's the stairs that are killing her, but I know. I can see the look on her face. I've seen her listening in the pantry. The pantry? I thought you said you only heard the sounds upstairs. Not anymore. It's everywhere now, Alex. Everywhere, all over the house. Upstairs and down, and not just at night now, either. All day, too. As though he was seeing something, searching for something. Clara, stop talking this nonsense now. Stop it, I say. Oh, sometimes I think he's lost. Everything has been changed around here, so even his little room is gone. And he's frightened. He can't find anything for Million, so he keeps running and running. Now, be quiet. Clara, I'm going to get to the bottom of this thing once and for all. I want you to come upstairs with me now. Oh, you'll never find it, Alex. Never. Because he's not there. I've searched for him myself, and he's not there. Pull yourself together, Clara. I want you to come upstairs with me now. Whatever it is, we're going to hunt for it and root it out now, forever. No. Why? Because it's a ghost, Alex. It's a little frightened ghost. A ghost who used to live here in peace until we came. It's the ghost of a little dead child. And we have destroyed his home. Oh, I told you not to tear down the rooms, Alex. I told you. Now he'll never be at peace, never in all this world. Clara, do you realize what nonsense you're talking? This is a, practically a brand new house. There's scarcely a stone of the old place still standing. That's just it. That's the terrible thing. Alex. Alex, will you do me just one favor? What? Tear down the new billiard room and put back the old walls again. Give him back his little room. What? It's where the bar is now. That's where his room used to be. I know, because he seems to stop there. His footsteps pause, and it's as though he was standing looking for a favorite corner, a place perhaps where his toys were kept. And one night I... I thought I heard him crying. Clara! If he could have his room back, his little room, then perhaps he'd stop searching. He'd lie down and go to sleep again. You mean you actually want me to change everything around up there for this brainstorm, this sound I've never even heard? It's not a whim. It's as real as... Alex, if it were a real child up there, if you knew it was a real child lost and lonely in some way and imprisoned in this house, wouldn't your heart ache? Wouldn't you do anything for that helpless, bewildered little child? Well... He hasn't anyone. He's utterly alone. And he doesn't know what's happened. He's not old enough to understand. He just keeps hunting and hunting for something familiar. Up and down the stairs and across the floors all day and all night long. Until his little legs are tired out. Darling. Oh. Come and sit down. You're shaking like a leaf. <sighs> That's it. Now, close your eyes. I'll get you a glass of water. 
then you won't do it. You won't do anything to help him. We'll see, dear. I'll have to think about it. After all, it's a big job. It would cost thousands of dollars. Oh. Meanwhile, I think you really ought to have a talk with Dr. Peabody. I'll call him in the morning. Hello? Oh, yes, Dr. Peabody, this is Mr. Archer. I've been waiting for your call. Yes? Well, that's very good. I'm glad to hear it's nothing serious. She's a nervous type, always has been. Imaginative, high-strung, and she... Yes, I've heard that, too. Well, of course, I never intended a humor in the notion myself. One can't. The house is finished completely. Yes, that's right. Well, I thought the same thing myself. No, we haven't used the room up there very much. Not yet. Too busy at the office. Well, if you think it would take the curse off, I'd be glad to stay up there as much as I can. Clara? Oh, Clara? Yes, Alice? Where are you? Down here in my bedroom. Well, don't sit down there in the dark. Come on up and keep me company in the billiard room. It's nice and cheerful up here, darling. Clara? Clara, are you coming? Yes, Alice. Well, isn't this fine? You see, I've got the whole place fixed up for you. What about a chair? A chair? Yeah, sit down. What about that nice bamboo one over there? You like that? I had it sent up this morning, especially from Abernathy's. Goes well with the room, don't you think so? I suppose so. Alex. Oh, well, uh, that reminds me. What about a little good music? Turn on the radio, will you? Like good girl? The radio? Mm-hmm. No, no, Alex. What's the matter? Not in the mood for music tonight? It's... It's too late to play the radio. Well, Clara, it's only nine o'clock. Here. Alex, Alex, I'm asking you just this one favor. Please, please don't turn it on. Nonsense. It'll do you good. Cheer you up a little. <laughs> there. That's more like it. Alex, please, turn it off. It's, it's too loud. It's not fair to him. Him? I don't know anything about any him. Uh, come on. How about a highball? Oh, I knew it. I knew it would wake him. Oh, turn it off. Turn it off at once. Clara, Alex. I forbid you to turn off that radio. Do you hear me? Now, once and for all, you must control yourself. Let me go. He's stirring. He's awake. And when I work so hard all afternoon to get him to sleep, he's stirring. Oh, turn it off quickly. Alex, can't you hear him? I have your heart and stone. Turn it off. Oh, all right. There, it's off. Does that satisfy you now? No. No, he's awake now. There he goes, back and forth, back and forth. Oh, darling, why did you waken? Why didn't you stay asleep? Yes, stay asleep so I I could get some rest. Oh, blessed baby. Be still just for a moment. If I, if I sing to you, will you be... Still again, still as you were this afternoon. Lullaby and good night with Moses be died with me.
So you see, gentlemen, the thing has progressed to a point where it's now utterly beyond my control. And frankly, life has become insupportable to me, gentlemen. I know now that her little delusion has grown into a form of madness. That's why I've called you here. Much as I hate the thought of your taking her away... You must not regard Dr. Kiesler's treatment, Mr. Archer, as anything but beneficial and necessary. Uh, Dr. Kiesler, don't you think that a few months of your treatment will restore to reasonable normality? Definitely, my dear Dr. Peabody. You see, Mr. Archer, it's quite simple... Your wife's malady is, in fact, uh, rather common in psychoanalytical literature. She's suffering from what we Freudians call the idée fixe. It has no doubt arisen from some old frustration, the desire for a child of her own. Yes, uh, Dr. Peabody's already explained the medical background. Well, uh, shall we go to a gentleman? Where is she now? Upstairs in the billiard room. She's almost always there now, sitting inside the crib. The... the crib? I sent for one yesterday at her request. She cried and pleaded so. I thought it best to humor her, at least until you began your treatment. Ah. Seemed to quiet her. Before that, I would find her holding out her arms like a cradle or trying to make up a little bed on the floor. Yes, well, that is quite interesting. Uh, Let us go to her now, please. All right, gentlemen. This way, please. Open the door. Why'd you not open it? Locked. She must have found the key somewhere. Clara! Do not frighten her. Speak to her quietly. Ask her to come out. Very well. Clara! Clara, dear, I don't want to disturb you or wake up the baby, but there's someone here to see you. Someone who wants to help you and the baby. She doesn't answer. We'll have to break down the door. There's no other key? No. Well, do not do anything drastic yet. The fear of capture may do more harm than good. Speak to her again. What shall I say? I feel like such a fool. Well, speak to her about the baby. Tell her the, the baby is with you, that you have just heard his footsteps going down the stairs. Tell her that you have seen the baby in the garden a few moments ago, and that it was crying for her. Oh. Clara... Clara, dear, uh, I've said all along that I never heard the footsteps. But, Clara, dear, just now, just a few moments ago, I heard him. I heard him going past me down these stairs. Go on. You can't keep him locked in there, you know, forever, Clara. He's only a child. He's young and active, and he wants the sun and the air. The grass, the trees, and the flowers. He wants to play. He never plays, does he? He never plays with you. Good. Very good. Go on. Why don't you come out now and go out a little, at least into the garden? He's already gone. I heard him go past me a few moments ago, toddling down these stairs. I heard him running down out of the dining room through the French doors. I heard him. She's getting up. Yes. Keep on. She will come out in a second or two. I heard the sound of his laughter beside the garden pool. That's where he should be, Clara. Not in this house, this gloomy house where he's been so lonely and afraid. But out there. Out in the sun under the blue sky. She's opening the window to look out. Did you hear that? Yes. It's coming now. It's working out in a few moments. (laughs) That. What, Mr. Archer? That loud, queer sound. Just now. Like laughter. Like the laughter of a child playing. I heard no sound, Mr. Ar- Did you hear sound, Doctor? Uh, no. Now, don't tell me. You must have heard it. It was everywhere. Right next to my elbow, here in this hall and down those stairs. As though the walls and the ceiling... I'm sure you, Mr. Archer. Well, it does not matter. Uh, please go on. But it was so distinct. It was just as though... Listen... You don't suppose that Clara, that anything has happened to... Clara! Shh, please. My dear Mr. Archer, please, please do not frighten her. A few moments now. She doesn't answer me. Clara, answer me. What's the matter with you? Answer me, Clara! Clara! 
Sarah! I don't like this. I don't like it at all. Mr. Arthur. Give me a hand, one of you. We'll have to break down the door. Clara, answer me. Here, one of you, Dr. Peabody, help me. It's not a strong dog. Put your weight against it. Now, don't just stand there. Mr. Arch. Come on, now, help me. Help push it. Yeah. Clara. Where is she? She was right here a minute ago. She was right here. I heard her open that window. Dr. Keesler. Mr. Archer, I don't think you'd better look out now. Your wife is in the garden. Columbia Workshop has brought you Remodeled Brownstone, a drama written for radio by Lucille Fletcher. The director was John Dietz. Featured in the cast were Martin Gable as Mr. Archer and Ann Alsner as Mrs. Archer. The current workshop productions are under the supervision of William Spear. With this production, the Columbia Workshop concludes its Monday schedule. The next workshop broadcast will be heard at 10 p.m. Eastern Wartime on Tuesday night, November 10th. Hitler and Hirohito are always listening. An unguarded word from you may sink a ship. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. That was Remodeled Brownstone from Columbia Workshop here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. That was a uh, choice made by Joshua for this week's episode, but... Also, Joshua was fulfilling a request of sorts from an iTunes comment about more women in old-time radio. So last week we had a Fletcher uh, written play. Mm -hmm. So it's two weeks in a row of Lucille Fletcher. Because she's the only woman in radio that I know of. (laughs) (laughs) No, I just happened to read the iTunes review at the same time I was considering what to bring to the podcast next and mm-hmm. remodeled brownstone has been on my list for a while and i thought it's yeah. a very different type of story than fugue and c minor so i thought it was an interesting contrast it's really interesting the backstory uh, that you had in the opening about fletcher uh, there she was just basically a typist which <laughs> <laughs> is so uh i don't know what the word is uh cliche yes thank you <laughs> She's a typist and then said well, I could do this, <laughs> and was actually brilliant at it. But I would say that having read all of those plays probably helped a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, I'm sure she has some natural ability to write, but having read all those... Oh, yeah. I mean, we perform old-time radio shows and often have to transcribe them. Mm-hmm. And I've figured oh, out yeah. that in the process of retyping these things, you really can understand what the writer was trying to do in a different way than just listening to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get a sense of word by word what the decisions were that went into Mm -hmm. that. Or what was that decision? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Why? (laughs) Do I really have to type out, huh? (laughs) Has she, I guess this will give away where I'm heading with this, but has she ever failed? Has she written anything (laughs) terrible? Because I have not seen it yet. There's a day going to come that I'm going to bring an episode in that I don't know that I would say it's a failure, but it's it's off the beaten path for yeah. Lu- Lucille Fletcher. I'll just leave that as a teaser for someday in the future. Is it the day Sinatra got fat? That is not the script. <laughs> Writing it... under that pseudonym, Arch Obler. <laughs> is it Gorilla Pilot? <laughs> no singing gorillas in her uh, war. But I... I don't know that there's ever been one like, eh, that's kind of garbage, Lucille Fletcher. I, I don't know that I would say that, that I've ever heard. Well, this was... A really suspenseful, I not really as suspenseful as it was, just terrifying. And I loved the pace of it up until the very end. This was just a two person play. I was a little disappointed at the end when we heard more voices Mm -hmm. because they did such a brilliant job, she did in the writing of it, figuring out how to keep this two person. 
the phone calls, we usually in old time radio, in a phone call conversation, hear the person on the other end in that tinny, you know. And in this case, not only did we not hear the other person making the actor have to pause the right amount of time and all that pacing that has to be done, which is something when you're directing a show on stage that makes me crazy. Like, you know, you got to hear what they're saying. You can't just answer it. But in addition, without any information, we were able to discern, for example, in the first phone call that they were elderly. And of course, they Mm -hmm. didn't have any kids. And you think they were elderly? No, no, the, the person that she was calling, the neighbors. Oh, okay. I was like, through the... You, you totally made right. me completely re-envision this entire play. <laughs> no, through the dialogue of that phone call, oh, yes. you're able to discern that without her going, oh, they must have been old. She'd never even said that. And it's just testimony, again, to brilliant writing and being able to allow us to come to conclusions without being hit over the head with them. But then at the end, when we get that third voice in... At the very end, I was like, oh, I wanted to figure out how to <laughs> we, do that the whole way. We do have a third voice in the realtor at the top. Oh, you're right. But I had to go back, because the first time I heard this, I was convinced there were only two characters in it. Okay. Because that's where all the focus is, and the other characters are so peripheral. Right. Uh, yeah. I convinced myself of the same thing. So we are not fans, any of us, of the tease before the show. Mm-hmm. Like, here's a sample of what you're about to see. Very 1980s, 1970s TV cop show kind of move. Uh, In this case, there is somewhat of a tease. Yeah. Her singing the lullaby Mm -hmm. without any context. And in this case, I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. I think this is something that the Columbia Workshop might have done. Because I seem to recall when we last listened to the Columbia Workshop, it was the Signalman. And they Mm -hmm. open with the train sounds. Oh, yeah. To sort of establish the mood Right. Because it doesn't really tell you anything no. definitive about what's about to happen. Right. So that opening was very intriguing. It worked in the sense of, oh, I can't wait to figure out how this fits into mm-hmm. something called remodeled brownstone. Why is there this lullaby? This eerie lullaby. Right. Very eerie, by and the way. And it starts out really strong and then fades and there's a little echo effect right. as if it's just vanishing from the world. Uh, <laughs> And that turns out to be the case at the end. Another great hook at the beginning of this was sit down, gentlemen. Mm-hmm. And so you spend this entire episode, who is he talking to? And not being told till the end. That was very effective and cool as well. Plus, it creates a nice way to deliver the narrative. Yeah. Like he's telling it to these people. Mm-hmm. I think you get an idea of who these people are. One of the things I love about those first lines is how much it packs in. We say, Sit down, gentlemen. You're experts in the matters of the mind. And I hope you'll understand when I tell you this house has nothing to do with my wife's terrible condition. And right. so <laughs> it probably does because yeah. <laughs> this is the opening <laughs> line. It establishes... <laughs> His voice as well as... Yeah, he lies to himself and to her, whether it's consciously or not, throughout. And then, not far on the heels of that, of that somewhat elaborate, luxurious description of brownstones, Mm -hmm. which I thought was really nice. Yeah, I don't know a lot about brownstones. I don't either. (laughs) And it was interesting to hear the description of them and the romanticism behind them for someone who lives in New York. They've been there forever, their original housing or something. Yeah, their Victorian era. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that growing up in that area that you see these all the time. Well, you see them all the time still on TV or movies that are filmed in New York. It's a big romantic part of New York's history. It would be like us describing to someone from New York what it's like to go up to the cabin (laughs) (laughs) that's been in the family for 45 years. It's so important to a ghost story is that sense of place. And I thought it's a nice contrast with Fugue and C Minor as well, because in a totally different way, we've got this sense of place, this bizarre house House built on pipe organs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I really liked the, in in the intro, you had called this a contemporary sort of Victorian ghost story. Uh, And I think that matches with you saying this is not a suspenseful story, Mm -hmm. it's a dread story, um, which is kind of what Victorian ghost stories were, an older sense of what horror is, more in the literal, this is a horrible feeling, rather than I'm afraid of what's about to happen. Yeah, I mean, we kind of know what's going to happen as soon as... Well, first of all, they gave us the lullaby at the beginning. And then in the tour... When they were thinking about buying from the realtor, oh, this is the nursery, and now we're in. And even before that, there was a nice little touch I heard at the same time of when she's in the kitchen, she can almost smell the heavy Victorian meals. Yes. And he's told the gentleman that she's having some problems. She's having problems (laughs) that she's uneasy being in this place. And 
there is no suspense to what's going to happen except what is the ending going to be. Yeah. How it's going to work itself out. Yeah. And how each new bit of information is revealed is what makes it, I think, compelling. There's also interesting thematic stuff going on because you chose the brownstones because they're Victorian. And Mm -hmm. so is this, as Tim points out, this style of ghost story is very Victorian. It Mm -hmm. reminds me of all the classic M.R. James ghost stories where it's about dread. You said it well. It's this build up to the sense of inevitable. And there's also a little bit of a moral voice in it. It's back when ghost stories were attached to like consequences for actions on earth being felt in the spirit world. It's not the sort of nihilistic Lovecraftian <laughs> type of preying on innocence. Right. Everything that happens in here sort of reflects the state of the house and the state of the couple's relationship as well. So the sin was putting a pool table in that room. (laughs) There's that. On the most surface level, that's that classic ghost story of not having a respect for the past. The wife says you feels like you've desecrated something um, by putting a bar in it. Well, yeah, but that thing of, I want a beautiful, old, warm, brownstone Victorian building, and I'm going to gut it and make it all completely modern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He does talk about modernization and contemporary and upgrades and all Mm -hmm. that a lot. And I think that's on purpose. Oh, yeah. yeah. The idea of him repeating that over and over and over that this is not going to look like or smell like or be like other than the outside. Yeah. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. a brownstone anymore. And he's so frustrated with his wife talking about, you know, ghosts in the past of this house because he keeps saying, there's nothing left of this old house. Right. And I find that really... a interesting theme woven throughout it about the past and trying to move on from the past without dealing with it. Mm Because clearly there's something that they haven't dealt with uh, because clearly his wife can't have children or that's heavily implied. We don't know why. We think it's medical because it's implied at the very end when the um, doctors are all speaking and when he talks to Dr. Pearson on the phone. And that's clearly something they haven't talked about that he sort of brushes away. Which leads me to the question of it could be in her head. Other than he hears the kid at the end of it, but before we get to that part of it, it is arguable that there is no kid ghost. It's arguable there's both. That right. she, she's imagining it and there's a ghost. <laughs> wow. I, <laughs> I make that point just because... Mushroom cloud. Um, <laughs> She starts by hearing footsteps running around like toddler, and at the end, she's taking care of an infant. So I don't know if there's two ghosts or, or, or if this maybe ghost is euthanizing. Right. Ghost of Benjamin Button. Which then leads to one of two things happen. She kills herself and throws herself out the window, or the ghost kid killed her, which is the greatest sentence I've ever uttered. <laughs> <laughs> or she's trying to arrange to take care of this kid forever. Yeah. Oh. That's how I read it, because what happens oh. is you hear the baby laugh for the first time after she's died. You hear joy coming from the baby, and that's oh. also when the husband finally hears the child. The baby's laughing now that the husband has finally realized what he has lost. So there's still this sort of because sadness quotient that is Children are met. terrible, I think, is the point <laughs> yes, of the story. <laughs> so, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. It's deceptively complicated underneath this very simple veneer of storytelling. And then, of course, there's always this layer that Peabody is still a funny word to say. <laughs> <laughs> was that his name, Dr. Yeah. Peabody? Yeah. It, so it was it, a dog with a little bow tie? <laughs> yes. It's in my notes. I'm 12 years old. Peabody is hard to say without giggling still. <laughs> or if you live out east, it's Peabody. <laughs> that's Peabody? Peabody is a Oh, that's what you go through when of, you're 13. <laughs> Shut up. Like a suburb of Boston, and it's pronounced Peabody. A small little thing I enjoyed, uh, when he invited his wife to come up to the billiard room and hang out, playing pool, <laughs> turns the radio on to generic loud jazz station. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Would you like a highball, dude? He's, like, he, he's got that, all the moves. There's a thing again that happens a lot in these old-time radio shows. And I know it's dated. I get it. But how they talk to their wives. If my wife said, turn off the radio. Yep. Oh, yeah, sure. It's like, no, no. Like, ah, I can't even imagine the look I get. I said, turn off the radio. But why you wouldn't do that for your significant other when they ask you. And then when she's pleading. 
And he's still like, no, like I couldn't look mm-hmm. at my wife pleading, please turn that up and go, nope, nope, not going to do it. <laughs> That's so weird to me. But I think he's trying to cure her. Well, yes, narratively, he is trying to cure her because the doctor has said, you know, go play jazz music and give her highballs. <laughs> it works every time. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, Lucille Fletcher is obviously working in the world of her day, but I think she's also intentionally amplifying all that. There's a big yellow wallpaper vibe yeah, going yeah. on here. But I mean so yeah. specific as in it is a woman who ends yeah. up locked in the nursery at the end and the husband is afraid for her life and knocks the door down. That's so specific that I think it's part of what she's doing here. Mm-hmm. And obviously I'd be interested in you know our female listeners' point of view on this because we're three white guys with a common interest, so we had to do a podcast. <laughs> it's just a, a cultural compulsion at this point. Um, <laughs> I think it's our place to lecture on lady stuff. I don't know. <laughs> lady stuff. <laughs> that says our it place. all. <laughs> but it felt to me almost a happy ending, like a relief that she got away from him. Mm. I mean, I know the woman died at the end, but like I was like, you got out. You go hang out with the ghost baby. This guy <laughs> is a jerk. <laughs> yeah. There is a great moment performance wise and writing wise when she sings that entire lullaby and he doesn't interrupt she gets to the whole thing which allows me to picture in my head the half open mouth of the husband just staring at this Mm -hmm. he doesn't say hey whoa what are you doing hey there's no interruption she gets to the entire lullaby like third verse fourth verse like a church hymn (laughs) <laughs> she's getting through all of it so again we're allowed to participate in the process by not actually writing anything but that length of time wow he, he must be horrified and standing there going what are you doing and then there's just maybe this... backing out of the room slowly <laughs> <laughs> there's just this beat of silence when the song finally ends and then we cut straight back to him mm-hmm. talking to the doctors again and right. so it's such a nice connection because hearing her sing an entire lullaby to the ghost baby is what made him call these doctors <laughs> together so like it really gets us right up to where we left him the time you say ghost baby it makes, <laughs> it's, it's hilarious uh, the last thing really we should have been a ghost baby was uh, yes uh, thing that cries in the night thing that cries in the night yeah. i love a mystery i think is the last time we said ghost baby that yeah, many it's times it's been too long guys this is nice. <laughs> ghost baby <laughs> Um, in the, that same vein, though, when the when the doctors do show up and realize, like, you bought her a crib? Yeah. <laughs> His explanation was fine. Yeah, until we could figure this out, I just, I'm appeasing her. I think it's part of a series of events that it eventually gets him to the point of where he's hearing that baby of, mm-hmm. like, I'm buying into reality little bit by little bit. Right. Maybe even subconsciously and not, and not knowingly buying. Yeah. Like, I really like the guy who plays Alex, her husband. Oh, yeah. And it's a little over the top, but because he's kind of a domineering jerk, I just really like it when he's regaling the doctors about the charming brownstones. (laughs) (laughs) It's just short of over the top. Too much more, and it would be a little distracting. The little note of getting woken up the second time in the little night of, like, I'll call the exterminators. The exterminators were here this morning. (laughs) Yeah, that's how little I care about what's happening. He made me he made me really mad because he blames it on rats, but when they first walk through the house, she goes, Oh, do you think there are rats? And he's yeah. like, What would rats want in an empty house? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> it's an empty house to breed their filth in the quiet solitude of darkness. Come on. <laughs> it's like rat heaven. Jerk. Knows nothing about rats. <laughs> He does occasionally sound like, is it Matt Berry from uh, Toast of London in the IT crowd, the English what actor are you who uses looking this very at me pompous for? voice. To the boss? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah Never mind. At, that didn't land with Eric I at think all. He's, <laughs> look at I think he's the same actor from The Mighty Boosh. I am so not invited now. <laughs> are you we need a, saying real things? We need a different middle-aged white guy for our English comedy <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. Again, this week, I picked an episode of Monty Python. (laughs) (laughs) Eric! Well, any other final thoughts before we wrap up our... I like child, C as in coffin, when she was spelling child. Oh, yeah. (laughs) There are a lot of nice little touches. Just the horrifying realization about a, a dead child beyond 
it being a dead child, but when she's trying to explain it to her husband, was saying like he doesn't know what happened or where he is, and he's lost, oh, and yeah. it's just. And she's like, don't you have a heart? In that moment, I felt like she was talking to me, the listener, because I, I was just going, oh, yeah, it's a story about a ghost baby. <laughs> and you're like, I'm a monster. <laughs> you know, at the end of this, our fear and anxiety are ratcheted up pretty high. So you're sitting there, and you're like, wow, that was a lot. And then Hitler and Hirohito are always listening. <laughs> Remember, thanks. Thanks for ratcheting up my anxiety just a little bit higher. Yeah. We just made you listen to this, and then... Oh, by the way, before you sleep, remember, Hitler's always listening. <laughs> All right, stance test time classic. Tim? <laughs> um, it certainly stands the test of time. Um, it's got such subtlety to it that it's almost ducks under being called a classic. I don't know what I mean by that, but it's not this big flag waving, I'm a classic radio program. Um, <laughs> so I might not call it a classic for just arbitrary reasons, but I think it fits well into Columbia Workshop, this idea of we're going to experiment and just try mm. stuff and do what you can't do in a normal radio series. Uh, and I think this is a great example of what you can do when you try that. Yeah, I've listened to a number of stories from the Columbia Workshop, and ironically, I think it's the stories like this that on the surface aren't reaching as far to be experimental that stand the test of time yeah. more. Because some of the stuff that was experimental in their day is sort of hackneyed now and, and when they just do something that is very traditional and classic like this mm -hmm. um, you really see all the hard work and all the small moments that are put into it from the sound design to the performances just the, the choices mm -hmm. like letting that lullaby play out which I don't think would necessarily happen Phone. on an inner sanctum for example right. <laughs> phone calls without the person on the other uh, end yeah they just are pushing the boundaries in smaller ways uh, that are really, really interesting. So, yeah, it definitely stands the test of time. I could talk for another half hour about all the subtle little things in here. Um, Do it. <laughs> here, just started to stop No, um, I, I laughed when Tim said it's not quite a classic because it doesn't wave a flag, but there's something about it as in... To pull out everything that's extraordinary it takes a couple listens to it. And I don't know if that's suddenly a new definition of classic to me, but I'm really on the fence uh, with it. So I guess it's a classic if you have a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> but if you need to just be picked up by the shirt collar and shook around, well, maybe you want to see a psychologist. <laughs> it doesn't quite do that. Um, I'm going to quickly say one of my favorite lines in here is uh, when the husband says, Clara, what will the servants think? I just mm. I just like the idea that you would um, <laughs> okay. hire people to come into your house and judge you. <laughs> That's why I would never want servants. I, I, That's what you guys do when you come over here. <laughs> we don't have to clean. <laughs> uh, that's going to change. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Joshua. For bringing that. You're uh, welcome. Tim, tell them stuff. Please go visit ghoulishdelights.com. That is the home of this podcast. There you will find other episodes. You can also find links to our social media, like Instagram and Facebook. Uh, you can also get a hold of us if you'd like to leave us a message and tell us episodes you'd like us to listen to. We will put them on the list and listen to them eventually. <laughs> it's a very long list, people. <laughs> uh, but thank you. Keep them coming. Uh, you can also go to patreon.com slash the morals and support this podcast. It really helps us pay our bills. <laughs> <laughs> And it makes us feel good. But mostly what makes us feel good is paying our bills. <laughs> uh, you can also go to iTunes and write a review because uh, we also like reviews, even though you can't pay bills with them. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Know, that uh. really <laughs> you can't shut off the gas. My podcast has five stars on iTunes. <laughs> that, to me, is exactly how I feel about people getting money from YouTube. I don't have any concept how that's working. All right. What's coming up next? So exciting. We are returning to The Shadow for an episode entitled Circle of Death. Until then, Hitler and Hirohito are always listening.